Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to this um, webinar this evening hosted by MHPN. Uh, my name is Vicky Cowling. I'm getting some feedback, I'm afraid. Vicky, your computer might not be muted. Okay, I'll continue. Apologies for that. Um, my name's Vicky Cowling and um, I'm facilitating this evening's session. Um, I'm a social worker and psychologist and have worked in the field of children of parents with mental illness and their families for about 20 years. Um, my role is to facilitate this evening, to introduce our speakers and um, keep us on time. Um, I'd like to first introduce um, our one of our, our first panellists, Amanda. Um, Amanda Wigley is an independent mental health recovery consultant, trainer, peer recovery specialist and parent with lived experience. And she's wearing a few different hats for this evening's discussion. It's great to have you with us this evening, Amanda. Um, there are lots of different meanings to recovery, I understand. Um, what would, what it, to you is the most important aspect of recovery, the topic of tonight's webinar? I guess for me, recovery is the lens in which I choose now to, to look at my mental health challenges um, and that it's quite, it's about personal recovery, Vicky. Thank you. Um, joining Amanda is Angela Bredovich and Amanda is, uh, sorry, Angela is a social worker from Victoria um, and has been associated with children of parents with a mental illness for a very long time. Angela, what, would it, what are some of the best programs and innovations that you um, can think of during your association with the Cockney field for the last 20 years or more? Um, I think the development of peer support programs that incorporate the development of peer leadership to make sure that the lived experience um, it sits alongside professional um, experience and service delivery. I think that's been a major development over the last 15 to 10, 20 years. Thank you, that's important. Um, we have Mary Jessup, um, who is a child and adolescent psychiatrist working in the private and public sector in Queensland. Welcome, Mary. Thank um, you. Can you tell us about some of the challenges you face in working with adolescents in particular and how you overcome these, particularly where adolescents have a parent with a mental illness, yeah. I think one of the challenges for adolescents is often if, if they are their first contact with any um, services in relation to um, making sense of their parents' mental illness, sometimes that it's often um, quite a way down the track. So I think it's very important to think about engaging earlier. But I think one of the really important things is really getting the, the unique um, an understanding of the unique experience of that young person and their family, um, which which certainly helps in the engagement. Yes, thank you for that. That's important as well. And last but not least, we have Lisa Whiting, and Lisa is a psychologist um, from country New South Wales. Um, what about some particular challenges you face, Lisa, in the area you work in, sort of southern New South Wales, oh, outside that's... metropolitan areas? Oh, there's um, not enough services, of course, in regional areas, um, and there's such a high demand for services for you know for my service and for um, psychologist services that you know often we have to close our books or um, trying to get the time just to get out to different regional areas that your local area covers um, and see everybody and yeah, literally just kind of have the time to do the job is is really difficult, and then confidentiality in a small town is another kind of challenge too. Yes, I imagine that's very, very challenging for families and parents, mm. yes. Yep. Um, well, thank you all very much for those introductions. Um, I can see that we have 215 <coughs> people online now, which is very pleasing. Um, so the topic for tonight, of course, is um, mental health parenting recovery um, with an interdisciplinary group discussing this topic. Um, Participants would have had a chance to read the um, read the case study and um, the learning objectives to which we're working tonight. So, the next part of our presentation is um, each panelist will give a very short um, discipline-specific response to the case study, 
and um, there'll be questions um, the panellists will address to one another and then to um, from between panellists and participants as well. So it's a, an interactive, collaborative um, webinar that we, we don't have all the answers possibly, but we certainly hope to um, engage you and contribute to further thinking and discussion about this important area. Mm. So Amanda, I'd like to start with you um, and your overheads, so that take us through those. Thank you. Okay, thanks Vicky. I guess um, first of all I'd just like to say as a, as a parent in recovery, I can really relate to um, having um, experienced trauma myself, um, similar to Karen. Um, <coughs> Um, what helped me in my recovery um, was staying connected to my children and um, that, that was really important throughout um, my journey and I think we can also see um, how important that is um, in the case study as well. Um, and I think someone helping me to talk with the children and the family about my experiences was also significant in my, my own recovery and I, and I think we can see a need for that um, in this particular case. I think uh, normalising of the experience, um, she's been through quite a trauma and um, if we can uh, use that lens, that recovery lens that I referred to that was quite helpful for me in the way that we look at the experience and that, that's extremely helpful, not just for, for uh, the person in recovery but for their family and children as well. So um, looking at uh, peer support, I think it's really important that a, a recovery peer specialist is not a psychiatrist, a psychologist, any other discipline, um, that, um, and they don't try to be, but um, I think this is one of the reasons why it works so well um, we're professionals in our own right and it's a new and emerging uh, workforce and uh, there's lots of research there that shows that we hold the key to a successful uh, recovery uh, for the person. We don't scream, we don't diagnose. What we do is we connect and we talk and that's really a really important element. Um, we're just ordinary people with all kinds of backgrounds who've walked similar mental health um, paths and that's what we use to connect with our peers. And at the same time, every day we're fighting similar battles and, and, and similar struggles with our mental health, and that shared experience is us to connect. I think um, some of the challenges that I've come across uh, as a peer specialist in peer support, are the, probably the biggest challenge is the lack of understanding of the role. Um, and I think there needs to be a lot more education in regards to this. Um, there's lots of research out there and I would encourage people to uh, go to the INROC website up here um, if they're looking for that kind of um, evidence and research. I think that um, uh, it's really important that peer support um, specialists and workers work collaboratively and one of our primary roles as, as peer workers is to encourage peers to engage in therapeutic relationships and clinical services and that's what makes I guess uh, the work of other mental health professionals more efficient and effective. We're like bridges um, uh, and that's, ha and that's um, quite significant. Spe peer specialists, um, we, we can engage one-on-one -on -one, um, and really our role is to listen and empathise um, and we encourage and inspire hope. I think the role of peer support uh, for a person with no experience of a peer specialist or peer worker um, it's really important that we clarify what our role is. So I would be doing that, um, you know, at wherever I came in and, and not just with other uh, professionals but with, uh, with the person with whom I'm working because even uh, as somebody going through that, uh, we still may not have encountered any peer, peer support workers um, in our recovery journey. So my role often involves explaining that I have uh, lived experience of um, mental distress and recovery and that I choose to be here right now out of my compassion and, and passion to help others in similar situations. I, ha I explain how I've become an expert of my own recovery and this often can be, um, uh, it, well it's really effective and profound not just on the peer but on their family and, and also other colleagues um, in the field. I don't profess to have all the answers, um, I just, it, I've walked through it 
and I've come out the other end and I know the right questions to ask along the way. I know the language to use that can help the peer and the family member through the journey. So family recovery, I, from my, my experience, needs early intervention. And if Jan or her GP even uh, had access to a peer specialist in the community and I was contacted right from the beginning of something not being quite right, I would have gone out to the home within 24 hours of receiving the call from Jan to meet with the whole family and listen to everyone's story of what was happening. Once heard, I would attempt to facilitate an open dialogue a solution-focused family conversation. So what are we all going to do about this now? Um, and I'd inform the family of the mental health services and professionals available in the area and encourage and support them to use that. Um, uh, this, uh, this way of working is something that I've been trained in this open dialogue method and I would really encourage you, um, other professionals to, to look into it. It's well researched over 25 years of successful pra practice and the key is that the professionals go out to the home at the very first sign and we create um, some conversation and dialogue. Um, how I would engage with uh, Karen, I, I'd share of my story and my experience in an appropriate manner. Um, and I would also, uh, I'd be saying to, to Karen that um, I'd like to learn about your circumstances. I'd be saying, Karen, what's happened? And, um, and I would also then, um, as a peer specialist, with that lived experience, um, when, I, when I'm introducing myself as a peer specialist, often people will say, what's that? And that opens the door to lots of discussion and um, I, I, I find that that's most helpful. Um, I would be looking at how I could connect not just myself as a peer specialist but uh, um, look at uh, services or programs. We have a good program over here, the Parent Peer Support Program, and so connecting Karen with other peer, um, parents that are in recovery would be really important. It wouldn't just be up to me. I think that uh, recognising that uh, however we can support uh, Karen to uh, hold on to that role as a parent right throughout um, her distress and, and in her recovery should uh, take high precedence in what we do. I believe that uh, when the I is replaced with the we, even illness becomes wellness and what, what are we as individual mental health professionals doing to support the whole family with whom we're working to keep and maintain an adapt existing we um, you know, in, in, in all that we do uh, throughout the person's recovery journey because really we're only there uh, as professionals for a short period of time and um, the, the, uh, Karen and her, uh, her mother Jan, all the family um, need to, they're the ones that are going to be there in the end and um, we're not looking at ways at how we can support the whole family in, in, in what we're doing, educate them, um, then that's the best way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Many important issues there. There's a couple of housekeeping things for the panel. Could we please unmute your phones when you're not speaking? And Amanda, could you um, come a bit closer to the phone or turn it up so that people can hear you a little more clearly? Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll move on to Angela Abradovich now in the social worker perspective. Thank you very much, Angela. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, I suppose I wanted to start by um, thinking about the way I'd be approaching um, this with Karen by just reflecting on what the profession of social work would, what lens we would be looking through. Um, and that would be through the, the lens of social context um, and social consequences of mental illness, how environment shapes someone's experience of mental illness, everything from personality, um, stresses and strengths at, a, at an individual level right through to their interpersonal issues um, and broader social issues um, including economic and structural issues. Um, but really our purpose is to look at restoring and promoting recovery, um, well-being across the individual family relationships to make sure that power is um, restored um, as much as it can be to somebody's control. Um, and in that, being mindful of things such as stigma um, and discrimination, um, being able to promote 
access to services, people's rights um, and their ability to participate in a meaningful way in um, what's occurring for them. Um, and so most of the practice occurs at an interface between that individual and the environment that they're involved in. Um, and I would also be looking at it from um, a recovery approach and um, I've just um, suggested that the um, particular framework that Mike Slade from the UK uses, the recovery approach which identifies a number of particular um, recovery tasks that an individual um, um, is is likely to move through in their recovery journey is, is a good frame to use um, in thinking about Karen's situation. Um, the focusing on making sure that a positive identity is, is um, outside of being a person with a mental illness is um, uh, a focus. Um, meaning making in relation to framing the mental illness, um, having a satisfactory meaning. Um, ultimately being able to self-manage a mental illness, um, so moving from the transi transitioning from clinical management to taking personal responsibility um, for your own um, well-being and seeking help when you need it, um, and most importantly developing valued social roles, whether that's um, reclaiming um, or acquiring new roles, um, and all of those are really underpinned by relationships and the importance of hope to that process. So in that, clearly the parenting role, which is what we're talking about tonight, is pretty intimately related to the recovery process. It's one that, that in my experience, is a very hopeful um, role. It provides meaning, purpose, agency, um, and it's a very good vehicle for people to utilise in their, in their recovery approach. Um, professional, professionals nevertheless can be quite supportive in maintaining that um, recovery approach and that's generally through um, a collaborative process together with the consumer um, at every stage of working with them right through from assessment um, and planning and action um, and including crisis and that's one of the things I wanted to focus on with Karen is part of her um, experience in an inpatient setting. Often people believe that recovery is, um, doesn't, is not a concept that um, equates to an acute episode. Um, people's traditional notions of recovery um, seem to um, override but in this, in this case Recovery absolutely, I believe, is, is um, important in a crisis um, and it's one of those places where we can definitely give very strong messages about um, maintaining as much choice as possible and as much um, personal responsibility and identity and not losing that. Um, so um, I would be um, looking at Karen's context overall um, and I think using a strengths and vulnerabilities perspective, um, I, in her story, I'm seeing lots of things that are particular strengths that relate to recovery and identity um, and the supports around her. her. The closeness of her family support system, the history of that and the strong bonds that exist between her and her children and her mother. Um, She's experienced, even in the help seeking to support her, a GP who's provided some choice around how to access services during a crisis. Um, the, the previous assault that she's experienced has consistently been validated and acknowledged and attended to. Um, and despite the fact that she's been fearful, very fearful about what's been happening to her and the circumstances of her her, relation, her past relationship and the custody battle um, that's on at the moment, she's managed to trust professionals and those around her and commence some treatment and she's been exposed to the lived experience, the lived recovery experience of a peer worker while she's been um, in an acute setting. Um, nevertheless, um, her picture also, her story also um, reminds us that she's had intimate relationships that very much of featured conflict and violence. Um, 
the role that she finds the most joy in is the one that's under threat. Um, and I think really importantly is the power of a mental illness to thwart connection is, is apparent in here. Her help seeking and that of her mother's has been limited to some degree by the existence of um, the battle around custody, about the experience of her trauma um, and the stigma that's associated with a mental illness and psychiatric treatment. So we can see very much a, a fear of judgment and the fear of relationships being dis disrupted um, in people's attempts to work through what's happening. Um, and we've certainly had children exposed to um, violence and concern about them um, and their separation from their mother, an issue that Jan particularly has had um, some concerns about. Um, so focusing on that inpatient unit stay, um, one of the things that um, I've provided a resource for for people is um, a thing called the Keeping in Touch with Your Children menu that we use in um, our inpatient service to um, attend to that issue of separation being um, traumatic for parents and for children and the families around them. And we know from research that this is a particularly important issue, maintaining connection and reducing the disruption to that parent-child relationship is important. Um, reducing the silence and the stigma um, that's associated with it. And we do that by normalising it, by expecting the topic of conversation to occur. And this particular menu talks about um, different levels of contact as the patient or the consumer is ready to move from simple phone calls to visits, doing all of those things with a thoughtful approach, um, prepared and with the parent fully involved at each stage. It's a very recovery-focused, trauma-informed approach that would ensure that children at home are knowing that mum is thinking about them and she is not um, left un uh, uninformed about how they're going and being able to provide them with some reassurance about how things are for her. Um, and then as well, I would be, as part of that and then in community work, be looking at the other major intervention um, uh, and that is promoting, keeping this conversation going, making parenting a normal conversation topic rather than one that um, is stymied by fear and by guilt and by judgment, a fear of judgment from others. Um, and this particular approach called Let's Talk About Children, which was developed in Finland by Tudi Salantis and the National COPME project is currently about to launch um, an e-learning course on, um, is a very recovery-focused approach, to, particularly to help making talking about children and parenting part of a, a natural conversation and alliance between the worker and the parent. And it utilises a developmental log to help promote a discussion and to allow um, a practitioner to take a step back and allow the parent to inform them as the expert on their child about their child and to allow that to trigger further conversations about future planning, looking at supports that the parent might, might need or goals that they want to focus on. Um, and that might move into considering how children understand their parents' mental illness, so demystifying that for them and supporting the parent as the most important person to deliver that information, the most potent person to deliver that information. Um, it's, um, it's one approach, but along with that there are others that um, also promote those conversations and planning. Um, family focus, which is another um, evidence-based um, intervention that you can hear about or learn about on the COPME website. Um, parent peer support programs that exist in many states um, and supported playgroups starting really quite early in making sure that parents with a mental illness are able to experience um, a playgroup environment that's sensitive to the needs that they have and allows them to build to further networks and supports themselves 
right through to peer support programs for children and teenagers um, where they can share their own lived experience, be more informed about mental illness, develop their coping strategies, um, and, and they're all essentially um, peer and um, interactive programs that I would be looking to support Karen in um, considering. Thank you very much, Angela. It highlights the need to think of the family as a whole and each family, each individual member in the family. Um, we'll move on to Mary Jessup now for the perspective of a psychiatrist on this topic. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'll be talking from the perspective of my work as a child and adolescent psychiatrist and also as part of the child and, um, Children and Parents with Mental Illness program that I work for. Because I think more often I'd be become involved in a family, with a family like this when, um, when someone might contact the service asking for advice as to how this the family can be supported. So coming from that perspective, um, one of the critical things that we, we consider is that the children are at increased risk of mental health problems, but also that the risk can be reduced. So we're keeping that in mind in the work that's, um, that's recommended or supported for the family. So we very much support a family-focused approach. Um, I think in, certainly thinking about parents and re recovery is that for them to have an, a, a sense of increased um, or, or regaining their sense of effectiveness in their parenting is one of an important aspect. But if a child or young person in the family is already experiencing mental health problems or other emotional behavioural difficulties, this presents an additional challenge for a parent within the recovery phase. So it's very important that um, these issues be identified, that re risk be reduced, but also parents be given information about how to support the development of their children through through a time that can be quite challenging. So the, the slide has sort of outlined some of the, the interactions between parental mental illness and child outcome. Now, consider that in relation to Karen's case. Um, the first is the importance of considering it as bidirectional um, so that if, um, if the children um, in this scenario, we know that Karen is finding it increasingly challenged, challenging to maintain her, her primary care role, her mother is starting to take on some of those roles and so we have some sense the younger child is becoming clingy. We know that Tom, the elder 19-year-old, is resuming, uh, assuming some role in supporting his mother. Um, we, watch, we, we don't have a full sense of the middle child of how this child is responding. Now, if these children are responding in a way in which there's increased emotional distress or behavioural difficulties, this presents an additional um, stress for the mother and she may start to interpret. It may contribute to increasing guilt. It may result in her um, feeling less effective as a parent um, and these are important factors to be aware of. Um, we, we also know some children may already have existing vulnerabilities so when there's an environmental stressor they're more at risk of having difficulties. So certainly the most, the most beneficial thing for within the family as a whole is for Karen to be supported into recovery as, 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 um, as quickly as possible in terms of this, receiving the appropriate treatment and support from both. Um, we, we know where she's got a, a diagnosis of depression and psychosis and, and begin, beginning treatment, but there's also the question of the impact of the trauma and how that will continue to affect her after the depression resolves. We have a sense that she had, she was functioning quite well previously. So one of the important things that's already been mentioned is, is that the, how critical it is for, for maintaining connection through that period of the mother, of, of the mother's illness. One of the really important things to consider for child outcome is how the quality of the parent-child relationship and parenting. Um, again, we know that there's been a change in this while the mother's been unwell, but, but certainly uh, if there can be maintained connection to try and um, support that relationship becoming, um, you know, re being re-established if there's been any um, breakdown or conflict is going to be very important. 
We also know that um, parenting style is altered by depression and often parents become less confident, they become, may become less dis more indecisive, there might be increase in hostility at times and, and those things are important to, um, to think about in supporting, uh, supporting the, the family. There, there has been some additional stresses for these children, both related to um, the mother's illness, but also unrelated. Um, we, we don't know whether this family is isolated from the community or in the school environment, and that's an important thing to consider. Um, we also um, we also know that there was being exposure to domestic violence potential domestic violence, as Angela has mentioned. So what we're trying to do in the approach is support with building resilience in both the children and the family. So we know that if these children can be supported to maintain age-appropriate age tasks, maintain relationships with peers, with other adults, that that's going to be valuable. But one of the other important things to consider is the children's self-understanding, their ability to make sense of their environment through the time when their mother has been unwell. And a lot of that self-understanding is, is established when, within the family context. So again, thinking about the family, what's the belief systems of the family? How are they? How do they organise themselves along while the mother is unwell? But also one of the really important things is if the grandmother has taken on a lot of the primary care role, how able is the grandmother to gradually reduce that role as the mother becomes more capable of managing the role herself? And one of the really important things in all of that is how well things are communicated and problem solved within the family. Just having a problem with moving my slide on. Okay. So what I'd be advocating for in this family is really it's normalising the struggles of par parenting. And we also know parents with mental illness will perceive themselves more negatively and often think that other parents aren't, aren't having the same struggles. So it's really important to normalise that. Um, it's, it's very important that parents have the space to reflect on their parenting role and their children's strengths, their vulnerabilities, to have a think about what might be helpful in supporting their child's development. Providing information um, about that, but, and part of that is the importance of children have, having a way of making sense of what's happening. So the importance of talking to children about parental mental illness is quite important here. Um, there's a, focusing on the family style of communication and problem solving ha and how able and willing the family is to access supports when needed. The other thing is part of the, um, the COPNI program is actually providing those psychoeducation and peer support groups. The COPNI program offers it to young people, but also there's been increasing um, focus on, off and on having psychoeducation and peer support groups for parents, which can be very valuable. So I just wanted to highlight, Angela's already mentioned, let's talk about children. I think one of the aspects of that is that it provides a really good guide um, for, for how best to communicate with children about parental mental illness and, and really thinking about how the language is directed in a way that children understand. I think one of the critical things is that children, is of what children, is what children exposed to and giving them an explanation of those things. It's also important that discussions are solution focused um, and that there's all, it's really important that there's, a, there's an ability to have communication and over time within families. So I certainly would um, advocate the use of an intervention like, like Let's Talk About Children because it not only provides those guides but also addresses a number of the other things I mentioned in terms of things that we would advocate in working with families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, we'll move on to Lisa Whiting now and um, Lisa's psychology perspective on Karen's family situation. Thanks, Lisa. Sorry, better unmute myself. Um, yeah, look, this was a tough one. It's kind of, you know, the, the five-minute short, short version of how to do therapy with a client like Karen or, you know, any client. Um, so, look, by the time Karen gets to me, um, she's met just about everybody in the known mental health universe in the Bega Valley in my area, anyhow, or in Pittsworth. Um, so when she gets to therapy, um, she's facing the challenge of trying to get back to normal life in her small community um, and after a, you know, a traumatic illness and a traumatic um, a, a crime. 
So look, my main role as a clinical psychologist, I think, is a bit more individualistic than what you can be in a when you're supported by a service. Um, it would be to establish Karen's therapeutic goals um, and then provide psychological therapy to um, treat her depression. So we're kind of aligning, if you like, um, the clinical recovery and the personal recovery. Um, look, it involves three parts, essentially. It's assessment, it's treatment, and it's collaboration. Um, oh. Is this slide. So, um, look, the assessment, a good assessment is crucial and it's ongoing um, with psychotherapy. Um, so in a nutshell, we want to know how Karen defines her difficulties. Um, we also want to assess her mental state, you know, looking at her mood, her affect, behaviour. She'll be used to this because she would have been through this all the time in the inpatient unit. Um, we want to look at risk factors too. And I think given her background, um, look, given the crime, like I'd want to be assessing for trauma symptoms along the way too. Um, then I would be looking at the biopsychosocial factors that would then um, be relevant across the, these four domains for a, psych, a psychological formulation. So predisposing factors, um, that what are they that might have rendered her vulnerable to the illness in the first place? Like is there a family history of mental illness? What about a previous volatile relationship? But it's possible she's a, a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, you know. Um, we think the precipitating factor in this case was the sexual assault. Um, but was there something else? I mean, it was a violent assault. It might be, you know, the trigger might have been someone walked past and didn't help. Uh, you know, that could be the thing that really got it, you know. So I think it's always worth checking. Um, and then, of course, what are the perpetuating factors that are ma maintaining any kind of dysfunctional symptoms at home? So um, negative thoughts like I can't cope like I used to or I'm a crap mum um, or avoidant behaviours like staying home all the time. And then um, there might be more external factors like she's got the stress of a custody battle. Um, and then other things like, you know, it's a small town. Was the perpetrator well-known, well-liked, well-respected? How is she going to be treated or believed if she tries to tell people her story? Um, but then on the flip side, you know, here's her protective factors. What are they? And they're most important in your formulation because they're often the foundation which you, um, you tailor your strategies upon for Karen. Um, so you'd be looking at things like, you know, her connection to her kids, um, her previous resilience and her coping strategies, um, intelligence, and then, you know, her more external supports like mum, her peer support worker, you know, other um, support workers around her, and, you know, some friends in the community too. Um, now, just randomly, I googled Pittsworth, and uh, it says when you live in Pittsworth, you very quickly become a part of a community of warm and passionate people. So... Um, Given that description of Pittsworth, I'm going to assume that um, <laughs> negative social evaluation isn't going to happen for Karen. Um, look, as far as treatment goes, well, let me not skip ahead here. Um, you do have to consider um, how many sessions you've got. Do you have 10 sessions with the Medicare Better Access Scheme um, or has she accessed more through a victim service um, program? So it's sad but true that you kind of negotiate your therapy around how much time you have with someone and that's where the collaboration can be very important too. You can hand over some of your work. Um, but look, I'd be firstly validating Karen's response. It's not her fault she was assaulted. It's not her fault she became sick. And it's a thousand million times harder to manage your regular life roles um, when you're in recovery as well. You know, it's a hard enough job being a mother, you know, especially a mother of boys. They're so active. Um, so, look, psychoed, um, psychoeducation is really vital. Like, sometimes even explaining a client's diagnosis can just be really therapeutic in itself and open up a whole conversation. And, I mean, by the time she gets to me, hopefully she, you know, has a good understanding of her diagnosis, but you can never assume that. You're always, it's worth checking um, and how she understands it. And she might have some, you know, disagreements. And perhaps you might want to involve some family members in this conversation too. Um, it's, you know, look, treatment strategies, this is tip of the iceberg, you know, there'd be, what, you know, 200 psychologists online probably going, I wouldn't do that, I'd do something else, but this is my kind of idea. Um, usually I'd be practicing some CBT or acceptance commitment therapy um, and mindfulness skills for symptom management and distress tolerance in depression. It depends on the person, on the strategies that you use. Um, really be targeting the negative automatic thoughts because they can perpetuate an anxious mood state as well as a depressive presentation. Um, so I might use some strategies like some cognitive diffusion techniques from ACT or, um, you know, using Karen's identified strengths to help, you know, start chip away at some of these cracks in her negative um, perception, start to gently challenge those. Um, they can be quite effective. 
Look, and there's more functional things with depression too, like your motivation, daily routines, sleep, you know, so you want to address all of those things too. And, I, you know, we could be, it's a whole webinar in itself, um, so I won't go into detail there, I guess. Um, what, on my next slide, I think I've addressed, I've indicated the Maastricht approach. Again, I don't have time to go into that, but just on the off chance that her auditory hallucinations are still present, um, the Maastricht approach is awesome. It's a technique that interprets voices as having a relevant meaning to an event that's happened in someone's life or events um, and created by people who hear voices. So it's, you know, it's very effective, particularly for people who have had a negative relationship with their voices. Um, so uh, moving on from that, um, values work. Um, I really like values work for, as part of acceptance commitment therapy. Um, that would be addressing with Karen what are her core values in how she'd like to live her life and then talk about the negative thoughts and negative beliefs and, um, and behaviours that maybe they're helping her cope in the short term but they might be getting in the way of her values in the long term. So, for example, she might have valued being really active in her community um, but in the short term she might be avoidant of any um, kind of social contact for fear of that negative um, social evaluation, which is not going to happen in the warm and embracing arms of Pittsworth, but maybe in another small town. Um, look, parenting here is likely is most likely to crop up in the conversation, um, and I would definitely try and incorporate some of the ideas from the Let's Talk program. Um, you're limited, really, in private practice. It's I've tried, and I'm still trying very bloody hard actually to try and get uh, Let's Talk to happen in private practice and it's difficult um, because of the limitation in sessions but certainly the um, concepts around strengths and how to talk to her, uh, to her kids about maybe what's happened or she might have done that already but maybe how she's feeling now, um, why she wants to sleep, why she doesn't want to face the other parents at school, things like that. Um, so also speaking of mums, What's her perception of her support from her mother? Like, what you know, has Jan been helpful? Has she been not helpful enough? Has she been a bit paternalistic maybe, you know? So just kind of clarifying um, how she perceives, how Karen perceives the support she's getting. And then, of course, you know, is Jan herself being cared for um, by a carer support service? Um, depends on the size of the town as to whether those resources are available to you. Um, so, look, I've just written a bit of a list of people who might be involved. I won't read through it. Um, and then technical oversight's actually fallen off the overhead before I sent it off, and I apologise, but the peer support worker has disappeared off my list here. Um, but actually, in my experience, peer support workers have been subsumed by or, you know, located within a mental health support service and the NGOs, um, like the um, psychosocial rehab service. So um, certainly wouldn't be discounting collaborating with a peer support worker because that's probably the one that, you know, maybe one of the people who's having more contact contact with Karen than anyone. Um, and someone brought up, just I noticed on the comments earlier, someone brought up legal support for when she goes through court. And of course, we know that stress, um, you know, increases your chance of relapse. And so, look, it's probably beyond the scope of this conversation, maybe, but um, collaborating with their legal team, I haven't put it on the list, but I think it would be quite important, you know. Um, I don't know who would do it, but I did suggest, you know, in some areas there's the um, Women's Court Support Service. I know there's one in the Bega Valley. I'm not sure if it's specific to here. Um, anyway, so something else to consider in terms of collaboration. And, look, um, uh, finally, to collaborate or not to collaborate. Uh, um, it's all good in theory and really there's no bad sides to collaborating in itself. Um, it's just the practicality of the time that it takes, um, especially in private practice and especially if you're quite isolated in private practice and you're not working with the GP who referred her or um, you know, you're not working with other psychologists who know the case, for instance. Um, so look, there, in terms of the, the benefits, um, there's certainly benefits to being clear about what everybody's doing. Um, so the, then you don't duplicate tasks, but also Karen needs to be clear about who's doing what. Um, and then what you learn from your other practitioners involved, that informs my, my treatment. Um, so I get a cross-section of pretty good, um, pretty accurate information, which then takes the guesswork out of my formulation. Um, and then I can incorporate that into the treatment strategy um, for Karen's depression too. And of course, you know, all the way through therapy, like, you know, are we, are we hitting the mark? Are we a bit off the mark? You know, how are you feeling? You know, if you're depressed as ever, like, what are we doing wrong? You know, it's always kind of checking in there too and checking in with the other workers about, look, is something else going on that I'm missing? You know, I'm not really sure, you know, Karen still feels a bit the same. Um, 
And look, as far as the challenges, you know, there's a real demand for services, particularly in a regional area. There's either demand for services or they don't exist, but um, sometimes you can't get your client into a service to then have difficulties collaborating with them. Um, confidentiality, of course, is a huge issue. Um, so, you know, they might be assigned a, a worker from a women's support service and it might be their neighbour, you know. So it's just, it's really difficult. You it, you can't guarantee confidentiality, really. Um and, you know, personally I find that nothing's sacred when you've got school-aged children because your worlds collide all over the place. Um, so, look, time to communicate to, uh, with each other is a huge challenge as well. And even travelling the country miles to get to case meetings, it's, it's practically it's impossible often in private practice. Um, so keeping up to speed with other people's treatments and making sure that you're all still on the same page, we're all still working towards the same goal, it's still Karen's goal, um, practically speaking, it can just be really difficult. Um, so, look, there you have it, that's assessment, treatment, collaboration or, you know, 101 in the short, short version. But essentially I'd see my role as helping Karen achieve her personal recovery goals um, by treating her depression, but collaboration with everybody else helps to inform my treatment um, to give me a more complete picture to be able to do this. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for such a comprehensive coverage of Karen's family situation. Um, there have been some very animated um, postings on the general chat um, and we'll come back to some issues raised in that in a little while. Um, I'd like to move now on to um, some questions the panellists had of each other and um, I believe you have a question, Amanda, that you would like to put to the panel generally. Yes, thanks, Vicky. Um, I'd like to ask the panel whose responsibility um, and who will assist Karen to speak with her mother and also her children about her situation and about her recovery and when would this happen? So who might be best to start that off? I can jump in there if you'd like. Great, thank you. Um, I think as soon as possible that discussion needs to happen um, and certainly um, I imagine part of it would have started because both Jan and Tom have been involved in Karen um, being able to access help in the first instance. Um, and I would be looking for any opportunity um, to normalise the fact that family conversations and discussions between the people that support her are critical to supporting Karen. So. Discussions with Karen about that being uh, a well-known um, aspect of good care for her um, and seeking her um, support and consent around that is, is part of that conversation. But nevertheless, Jan, as the carer of her children while she's in hospital, for instance, and um, Tom assisting that, clearly have a need for information um, that goes beyond just the role of caring that they have. They need to be able to um, be on the same page in terms of Karen's situation. So um, the inpatient setting definitely would be one where you would be wanting to promote um, those um, discussions with mum together with Karen, at times perhaps separately so that questions can be explored in depth as they wish. Um, and then in relation to her children, um, I think there'll be, most of the panel would be very much um, talking about the preparation for that. Um, what Jan and Tom can talk to the children about at home, what Karen can send messages home about to the children and her getting ready to explain to the kids um, why she's in hospital um, and what, how she is feeling and how she's being helped to get home as soon as possible. Um, and then when she leaves hospital, um, as Lisa's mentioned, um, far more um, of that conversation can continue. It's an absolutely essential part of um, stopping the silence from um, uh, taking control and um, lessening everybody's ability to connect. Thanks Angela. Just leading on from that, Mary could I just ask you are there 
particular issues to think about given the difference in ages of the three children in talking to them as um, Amanda has asked about their mum. So we have an 18-year-old, an 8-year-old and a 5-year-old. Yeah, I think it is really important to consider the developmental stage and clearly, you know, the, the, the 19 year old Tom is really a young adult and quite capable of taking on a lot of, um, a lot of the, you know, the adult language about various things that are happening. With the younger children, again, you're looking at different stages of being able to understand, but the really good starting point is really looking at what the children may have noticed and what language may already exist. Um, within the family and talking about those things. Um, you know, I think about the little five-year-old might have noticed that mummy wasn't, you know, has been a bit quiet. Mummy's been, you know, she hasn't been doing some of the things she's been normally doing. And sometimes you know, it's really, um, a lot of it comes back to the parent um, trying to establish what language they would like, how they would like their child to understand what's happening. It's not necessary to use technical terms. Um, what's important is that children have a sense that their parent has been um, unwell or, you know, they may choose to use a different word, that the parent is, is getting treatment and that things will <coughs> improve. Um, and that's probably one of the, the, um, the, the really critical things with the younger ones. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, Angela, you had a couple of questions. Um, one of them was for Lisa. Would you like to pose that question to Lisa? Yes, um, I... I was wondering, um, and Lisa's referred to this already, um, if, um, if you'd actually seen Karen in private practice before she'd been admitted to the inpatient unit, um, what sort of opportunities do you see you might have been able to have as her primary care worker in liaising with the inpatient um, team? Mm. So things that you might have been able to do even from a distance that might have facilitated um, the recovery process while she was in there? Yep. Look, to be honest, once someone is on the inpatient unit, I've tended to have a, um, a bit less to do with them and a little bit more to do with people when they're discharged and they've got um, that kind of a um, short-term case management. But I think certainly if I've been involved in the referral to the inpatient unit, then I want to make really sure that they're taking bloody good care of my clients. Um, so I guess the first thing is, you know, you'd be, I'd be um, giving them a treatment history, you know, with Karen's consent, of course, um, and especially regarding like pre-morbid function, like so looking at her strengths, what does she do really well before? We know this woman can get back to, you know, um, this really um, amazing level of competence with her kids. This is a, it's a hopefully it's a bump in the road. Um, can give them an indication from the sessions that I've had with her about what I know to be important to Karen. Most likely this is going to be her kids and encouraging, you know, probably hoping to encourage that, make sure her kids can visit, make sure there's a conversation about, you know, what's happening to mum and normalising it a bit. Your mum's been through a really hard time and sometimes people go, you know, they shut down a bit, you know, they, they can't be normal mum for a little while because they're just coping with a lot of stuff and that is, that's fine, it's not forever, you know, it has to start a middle and an end, hopefully, for most people. Um, and I reckon I'd also be letting them know about um, the concerns about the custody battle because that's probably going to be something that's playing on her mind in the background too, let alone recovery and the kids and all of that too. But, you know, that um, I think it said in the case study about um, is she worried about, oh, no, you know, they're going to think I'm crazy. How's that going to impact on my um, custody? So really kind of making sure that there's a focus on her strengths in the inpatient unit and that that's something that's worked on, I think. Yeah, whether they got time to do that. I don't even think, I'm not even sure if there's a psychologist in our inpatient unit here in Vega. I don't actually think there is. So they're hoping for the uh, psych nurses to pull their weight there. Thanks, Lisa. Um, <laughs> and did you have a question for the panel generally? Another question? I just thought it would be useful perhaps to explore people's um, understanding of the difference between the traditional... Um, notions of recovery and traditional practice and um, one that's informed by personal recovery? Yeah, great idea. Mm. Um, maybe Amanda, you could start that off. Um, I think uh, we're at, at, at risk of uh, colonising this, this whole word recovery because of the, the misunderstandings around it. it it's, um, we're referring to personal recovery not clinical recovery 
And um, I think, you know, we've got to be careful not to, to replace rehabilitation with recovery. And, um, and that's what we're experiencing um, in lots of um, different contexts. So for a person in recovery, it's an ongoing journey. It's, it's about educating. It's about growing and learning. And um, I think uh, if, if professionals can um, uh, be mindful of that, then um, that will be most helpful, especially in the language we use, the way in which we explain that to a person. Thank you. Um, Lisa or Mary, do you have anything to add to that? <clears throat> no, I reckon Amanda, um, Amanda summed it up beautifully. I think, you know, a clinical recovery, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't differ too much from personal recovery. It comes down to function. And if a person feels like they're functioning to a level that they're happy with in their life, yeah. I'm happy with that. You know, if, you know I worked, I've worked a lot with people in the past who have been hearing voices all the time and managed to work and, you know, get on with their life. Um, and if they're hearing voices, especially if their voice is a good one, who wants to get rid of that one? Okay, thank you. Um, there are some questions... Oh, now, Lisa, you had a question, sorry, um, also for the panel generally. Oh, I think that might have been answered by Mary, um, just okay. about the most appropriate information for different yeah. levels of children. I'm an adult psychologist, I'm a bit confused about kids, so I'd be probably wanting to um, collaborate or get a second opinion, um, but I think that's also where the Let's Talk stuff comes in really well too. Like, okay, Karen, you yeah. know, let's talk to your five-year-old, how much do you think they would... Um, um, you know, how much do you think they could take in and if Karen's unsure then I'd be wanting to get some help from someone else about how to guide her with that. Mm. Um, can, can I just add something there? Um, just in terms of, because I think it is often quite tricky and um, it, just to highlight there's a whole lot of information on the COPME website that's focused on particular age groups and how to communicate with them and what they, what is helpful ways of explaining. So that's sort of a good guide for people who might want a little bit more information about that. Mm. Thank you very much. Yes, fantastic resources on that website. Um, there were some questions from participants that we have. Um, one talked about support for, and it's been covered a little bit, but maybe there's something extra that could be added, um, support for Karen's mother and Karen's children. Um, we've talked about groups for children. What about... the Jan, her mum in particular, what sort of support do you think she might need and where might that be available for her? Um, Ange, would you like to start that off? Yes. Um, I, uh, this, of course, will be different according to states and cities' resources, yeah. but um, there are a variety of carer support programs, everything from Commonwealth-funded carer links um, programs that provide funding for respite um, through to um, agencies such as ARAFME or MIND where, um, and in Victoria, um, specific um, counselling services for carers as well so that if there are issues that are separate from um, their involvement with their family member for them for the carer themselves they can access counseling so there are um, there are resources available but they will vary very much from um, town to town and country to country and um, accessing a more general peak body to see what is available in the local area would be um, fairly important and um, Often, often run. They often run care or support groups of different sorts, either activity based or ones that provide specific courses in things like um, managing um, difficult um, behaviours, um, right, through to um, psychoeducation in itself, dual diagnosis. Um, they're they're usually available if you um, if you do a bit of googling. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, I understand that in Australia, at least, you know, there are 40,000 grandparents caring for their grandchildren. So it's an enormous number that's increasing in this country and elsewhere. Um, um, I just wanted to add along. Sure. Yeah. Um, having worked as a carer consultant in an inpatient unit, 
I think um, that often um, it's worth following up to see whether that carer consultant can make some contact um, with Jan um, would be uh, would, would be useful as well, and that can often be the first port of call um, for that contact. Um, which I think you know we we all agree at the earlier that um, support can be offered not just to Karen um, but also to Jan. I think is really important, and and uh, following up with a carer consultant either in the inpatient unit um, or some are out in community um, services yeah. as well as. as Helpful. I guess maintaining her health and well-being is very important given her role in the family. Mm. Um, someone has asked actually that if, the, if Jan wasn't around, what, what, what opportunities are there for care of the children? Uh, what sort of community or other opportunities are there for the children to be looked after? I mean, if, would foster care be an option? Um, maybe more distant family members? So I guess that's quite a dilemma for people working within this um, with this particular family. If Jan wasn't around, would Tom be expected to have a caring role? Any panel member can jump into that one. Yeah. I, I think um, I can comment if you like. I mean, I think um, it's a question with the 19-year-old um, may be capable of looking up. It's quite a big, big ask, but I think the only other alternative is looking at child crisis care services, child safety, unless there is extended family that can be contacted who are in a position to assist. It's very problematic because, you know, mm. you risk the children being separated from one another as well. Mm. Yes, yes. And it adds a, another layer of challenge for a family. And that's where it's really important. One of the things that's strongly advocated is parents, particularly if they have a, a history of becoming um, recurrently unwell and needing hospitalisation, is that they actually be actively involved Involved when they're well in establishing a plan of what what would be appropriate care for their children in the event of them coming into a hospital, and sometimes it may be a well you know a neighbour who's quite involved with the family who provides that support, but it also gives um, parent children um, when this the family support plan is completed, it also gives information about the likes dislikes the extracurricular activities and other things that might help create a little bit more sense of um, continuity or stability for the children so they're not completely disconnected um, from their from their um, their usual um, uh, life um, lifestyle. Mm. So. And I guess that um, forward planning, you know, it has various terms, advanced care planning and those sort of, that sort of language is potentially um, supportive for a family um, if things, if things become a bit unsteady. Um, thank you, Mary. Look, Earlier on, there was discussion about um, the compartmentalisation of services and the dilemmas that poses for, you know, particularly, say, adult mental health and child and adolescent mental health. Given you're there right now, Mary, is there something you'd care to say about that? Because I've, it came through in quite a few posts as being a, quite a dilemma. Can't hear you, Mary. Oops, I was saying it's a, I forgot to unmute. Um, but it is a very big dilemma. Um, we have um, many services that are either child focused or adult focused, and unfortunately, um, it's often difficult for people to bridge that gap in meeting if they present their their identified client as a parent, how do you meet the needs of the children and the other way around? Um, so and it's not um, I mean, that's particularly the issue with the adult services and child and youth mental health services because, in fact, they're not the same clients often um, accessing these two different services. So I think one of the really important things is sometimes a little bit of information can go a long way. And that's why I think the, the COPNY website, um, being able to direct people to, to um, parents to a whole range of resources, um, thinking creatively about how they might be able to access some additional support. But I think it really is an important issue because unfortunately um, the alternative is that intervention comes for these children and young people quite late when difficulties become entrenched. Um, and you know, if you wait for them to present to a child and adolescent focus service, often you know, there's a whole lot of opportunities for intervention that have been missed. Yeah, that community-based family support type and other kind of community-based agencies, yeah. Um, we're running out of time, I can see, so 
Could I go back to you, Amanda, and ask if you'd like to just um, have any final comments and observations about the webinar we've enjoyed this evening? Yes, thank you, Vicky. I think it's really important that um, uh, as professionals we reflect on how on our own practice and how we can look at ways that, at, at including uh, family more, that whole of family approach. I think uh, as a person with lived experience of recovery, what's been um, extremely problematic for me on my journey has been that silo effect where uh, there was those services there for, the, for um, my family, there were services there for my children, there were services there for me, but the fact that they weren't all talking to one another mm. really did um, have a big impact on, um, on my family and my recovery. So um, I can only urge that we, we um, you know, have more of these discussions um, uh, in the future and, and really as each individual practitioner we reflect on how we can be um, doing that more. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Um, Angela, final thoughts and ideas from you. I might just pick up Amanda's because it's a topic close to my heart and that is um, the concept that somebody who works with adults only works with an individual um, I think is a concept that needs to be put in a coffin. Um, it's, it's probably now um, far more reflected even in Victoria recently with the changes to the Mental Health Act where there are at least three principles that underpin the concept that other people involved in the life of a consumer with a mental illness, including the needs of their children, need to be taken into account. And so the challenge is there, the, the resources are there, the training is there. Um, I really think we're well beyond um, the hidden children staying hidden and the parents being silenced by fear of judgment. I think it's time for us to all step up have those conversations that are family inclusive um, and peer and lived experience informed. Well, we're moving slowly in that direction. Um, Can I jump in next there, Vicky? Yes, of course. Angela's just instilled panic in me, thinking, oh, shit, how am I? <laughs> I haven't got time to talk to everybody in 10 sessions with <laughs> the Medicare system. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to reiterate the importance of collaboration there and... Um, make sure that I'm doing a wonderful job of talking to everybody else who's involved um, to make sure that, you know, what I might pick up as being the kids' interests are being addressed, you know, through the more appropriate, like, kind of family support services and things like that in the area. Um, <clears throat> but um, Amanda said something earlier on, too, um, about inspiring hope, which she yes. sees as an important part in her role, and I think it needs to be an important part in all our roles, um, you know, which sometimes you might forget it, you know, in your, in your day of kind of client after client or something like that, but remembering that, you know, you might have the client sort of in your mind a lot on your work day, but they come in, you know, once a fortnight and you're all about them and they, you know, so you've got to be really present there and remember what do they want to do? They want to get through this and they want to get back to their normal life and, and you know, the reason they're getting support is that it's hard to do it on your own and they need to know that everybody around them believes it, that believes in them, that they can do it. Oh, yeah. yeah, but I'll see what I can do with that 10 sessions. <laughs> the word hope is, um, comes out in material I've read about um, the personal recovery pathway. Hope is one of the key elements. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Mary, do you have any final closing thoughts that you'd like to add here? <laughs> I think if the awareness builds up of the benefits of a family-focused practice, um, both for the parent and the children, um, I think that's a really important thing and people take the opportunities because I think it is very difficult. It's difficult to get the funding and the resor adequate resources. But if, there, if people working in this area consider how they might link people or might be able to do a little bit of the work themselves, I mean, that can go a very long way in a, in the, in the child's development and a family's function. Thank you. Um, we do have a few minutes left and um, we've got a few questions but I think I'll just um, sum up what, what has come through for this evening. Um, obviously collaboration is incredibly important um, but achieving that in some settings and some locations is very difficult, um, partly time, partly constraints of working under better access arrangements and the 
sort of um, allocated appointments that go with that um, and the limitations of working outside metropolitan areas. Um, something that did come up was balancing the needs of parents and children. You know, the parent is the client in this case, but the children have needs, the grandmother has their needs. How does one juggle all of that, especially if you're working with limited resources? Um, we've talked about the compartmentalising, the need for um, working with the, the whole family, but also somehow identifying needs and issues for each family member. We have at least five people here, the grandmother, the mother and her three children. They all have different, um, one could say, developmental needs, um, individual needs, educational needs, and that's an enormous, um, enormous workload if you look at it in terms of assessment and treatment and intervention. Um, the fear that parents have of their children being taken away has been long discussed um, and is still very pervasive for many parents. Uh, another issue that I've been studying myself recently is um, grandparents and their, we, Angela used the word, the children not being hidden anymore. Grandparents are kind of quite a hidden population still um, and they don't identify themselves for many reasons such as um, maybe embarrassment or guilt that their grandchildren have to come and live with them um, the cultural reasons why grandparents care for their grandchildren. So what is there to kind of talk about? It's something that we do. It's part of our culture. Um, so that's, you know, we've found another hidden population, if you like, almost. Um, so I think that, oh, and, yeah, especially, yeah, balancing the needs of parents and children. I've just noticed another little note I made about when, the, when a parent's in hospital and the need to um, help the parent on the pathway to recovery while supporting the children, um, having appropriate access to the parent, to seeing the parent, they're dying to see mummy or daddy, how do you manage that? Um, many, many compli complicated aspects to consider. Um, we're going to finish a minute or two early, but... Um, that's what we're going to do. So thank you all to... We've got 240 people online still. Thank you all very much for your very um, energetic and lively contributions to the um, general chat. We, there are questions we haven't answered, um, but hopefully the discussion will continue. Do go to the COPME website. There's masses of material available from that website. There's free e-learning materials available. Um, accompanying this webinar, there have been lots of resources available to you, so please make sure that you access those as well. Um, it's been a pleasure to facilitate this evening. Thank you all very much and good evening. <laughs>